Today, the Barclays Bank CEO stepping down as British regulators invest his ties to convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. And the White House giving federal contractors more flexibility in enforcing its vaccine mandate. But one trade group says some companies may just stop doing business with the government instead. And manufacturing slows down across the nation. Many businesses saying they're waiting longer than ever for raw materials. That and much more coming up on NTD Business. Good evening. Great to have you with us. I'm Paul Graney. The Barclays chief executive Jess Staley is standing down following investigations by British regulators into ties with convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. Staley dealt with Epstein during his long career at J.P. Morgan, where Epstein was a major private banking client until 2013. Barclays said last year that Britain's financial regulators were probing links between Staley and Epstein, who died while awaiting trial over sex trafficking offenses. The bank says it's disappointed at the outcome. It also says the investigation makes no findings that Staley saw or was aware of Mr. Epstein's alleged crimes. Staley has previously said his relationship with Epstein ended in late 2015, that he regretted having any relationship with him. And U.S. manufacturing activity slowed in October, with all industries reporting record-long lead times for raw materials. Also, stretched supply chains continue to constrain economic activity. The ISM survey also hinted at a slowdown in demand amid surging prices, New orders dropping to a 16-month low. The measure of producer price inflation rose 4.5 percentage points in October. That's 17 straight months of factory price increases. Many of the businesses surveyed said they continue to deal with an unprecedented number of hurdles to meet growing demand, including difficulties transporting goods and staffing troubles. So joining us to discuss the manufacturing da- data is the president of HM Manufacturing, Nicole Walter. Walter is also on the board of the National Association of Manufacturers. Nicole, great to see you as again. Uh, I think it's been a month since we last spoke. Um, things have been kind of chaotic with regards to supply chains, etc. I-, I think the big standout from today's data, for me at least, was new orders fell by seven percentage points on the month. Is that what you're seeing on the ground? And if so, what do you put it down to? Well, thank you for having me on again. Um, We've been actually really steady with our orders. I've seen an uptick since the last time we spoke. But I feel in terms of the reasons why you're starting to see things fall is that the supply chain is still quite a mess. So everything is pretty much stagnant. There really isn't much movement. I still have a lot of whip that I'm trying to process and get through. And so I feel like I'm holding up a lot of my customers, packaging equipment, um, all of those kind of lines. And so you're starting to see a a downtick, um, but that's probably because for us, we can't get any throughput out our doors. Last time we spoke, you you were looking for more uh, help. Uh, Has anything changed in the past month? I think the only thing that has really changed is that I'm starting to see more resumes. Um, But every time we go to try to fill that position, it just seems like it's not a good fit. You know, a lot of our machinists are so skilled and we need a certain skill set. And as much as we're so good at doing upskilling and training right now, we're so stretched thin. It's so hard to kind of develop those people and those skills. So we're looking for more of the advanced machining aspect of of employment, and that's been really difficult to find. And everywhere I go, it's everyone's hiring, everyone's looking for people. And so if it's not me, it's someone else that's down the street. And so we're all vying for the same kind of work pool. Mm. Last time we spoke, you told me even the people you have on your books, they're they're not quite as, I would say committed, but they're looking for more flexibility. Right. And it's hard to get them to work maybe a full week from from week to week or or month to month. I listened to an interesting discussion with an economist over the weekend, and he felt that this is the first time in decades where American workers maybe feel that the bargaining power is back in their hands. Because for the past number of decades, we were seeing manufacturing jobs moving overseas. Right. And a lot of people in, in the industry were afraid their jobs could be taken away. 
this is the first time in a long time we're seeing the opposite trend, right? Jobs are coming back and, and American workers are really in high demand. Do you think this is playing an effect? Absolutely. They get to hold all the chips and I don't blame them for so long it wasn't in their favor. But for us, it's so hard because when McDonald's starts raising their prices, Walmart starts raising their prices for low skill labor, it's very hard for us to keep, compete, especially in a global standpoint. We're already paying through the roof on materials. I just got a new email today from UPS that they're gonna be charging in 2022, 6% more for shipping. So that adds to the cost. Another email came through that the mills, because it's the first of the month, they're raising their prices. So everything just keeps raising and raising and raising. And it's starting to become a real burden on not just the small manufacturers, but the big corporations as well. And so when you're looking to hire and you're looking to train and upskill, that also plays into the factoring of how you're going to go forward, how are you going to start spending and the burdens and everything else that keeps equating. So it is a scary time for employers. Um, of, of course, it's great that the employees now get a little bit more of what they're looking for. Um, but I just read in the New York Post that on average, the American household is spending more of $175 a month. And so I feel like because of the inflation, because of gas prices going up, because all the costs are starting to go up, I, I'm hoping that eventually some of this stuff will start stabilizing. Mm. This particular economist had an interesting take as well. I, I wanted to see if there's any evidence for it on the ground. He felt that when the pandemic came, um, a lot of people stayed at home. A lot of people started to play the stock market, right, and play these um, Robin Hood and start investing. And, and we see, thanks to, in large part, to central bank stimulus, we see the stock market's been an incredible rally the past 18 months. And he feels a lot of the people who are working these really tough jobs, right, manufacturing is a tough job for a lot of people, that a lot of them are, are, are making money on the stock market and, and while that is lasting they, they feel that this is a way to, to to gain some income have you heard about any stories like this on the ground i actually have a few of my employees we kind of talk about it and what they're diversifying their portfolio on and i think it's great and i think it's important but it's also very interesting because you never heard that before and of course during the COVID year and everyone was home you kind of had to be cautious of what was going to happen next like no one really knew if they were going to have a job in two weeks or six weeks or in a few months so i i applaud them for doing so but i need them back at work and uh it's really great to see them kind of flourish and, and talk about something different and also really get into the world of politics and i'd love to hear what they have to say and how it's affecting them or not affecting them whereas before you couldn't have these kind of conversations and so i feel like your average employee really has gotten quite smart in the past year and uh, kudos to them. Wow, that's really fascinating. Nicole Walter, really appreciate it, HM Manufacturing. Thank you so much. And in a boost to the broken supply chains, it looks like the White House is giving federal contractors more leeway in enforcing its vaccine mandate. NTD's Michael Corder has details on the new guidelines released today. On Monday, the White House released new guidelines granting federal contractors significant leeway over how to implement the vaccine mandate. Federal contractors like Boeing, Lockheed Martin, United Airlines, IBM, UPS, and many more cover a broad scope of industries and employ a significant number of Americans. Well, pretty much every big corporation has a contract with the federal government. Doug Badger is a senior fellow of domestic policy studies at the Heritage Foundation. He says the economy is already facing shortages of goods and workers. You name it, we've got a shortage. We've got 100, we've got 100 ships uh, in line waiting to unload their cargo in the, in the, in the port of Los Angeles. Uh, we've got a shortage of truckers. Over the weekend, the head of a trucking association suggested that some companies likely won't follow the mandate and will instead just drop their contracts with the government. Badger says there are over 10 million unfilled jobs, while over 3 million fewer Americans are even looking for work than before the pandemic, and it's a bad time to force workers out. He adds that some companies also have their workers' unions to consider. That a lot of these large employers who are government contractors have another contract, and that is a collectively bargained agreement with their labor union that says, listen, boss, you can't just change the rules on us. Last week, 
19 states filed lawsuits seeking to block the mandate. If the lawsuits don't succeed, the mandate is set to take effect on December 8th. Michael Quarter, NTD News. But no such luck for unvaxxed city workers in New York. But 9,000 have gone on unpaid leave for refusing to take the vaccine by today's deadline. Thousands of firefighters have called out sick. Mayor Bill de Blasio told reporters about 9 in 10 city workers covered by the mandate have gotten vaccinated. and There have been no disruptions to city services as a result of staffing shortages. But workers in critical public safety jobs have challenged the mandate. One in four of the city's uniformed firefighters are unvaccinated. About one in six police personnel and sanitation workers are still unvaxxed. The fire commissioner says firehouses are open, but 18 of the department's 350 units were out of service and many units are understaffed, he said. And bad news if you're flying American. The airline canceled another 300 flights this morning, another 200 are delayed. That's on top of the weekend disruptions. The company insists its vaccine mandate isn't to blame, but does acknowledge facing staffing issues. And Denise Colin Fredrickson has the details. American Airlines canceled around 300 more flights Monday morning, and that's on top of nearly 2,000 flights it canceled from Friday to Sunday. A representative of the airline told Fox that they expect to see considerable improvement Tuesday. It's annoying because it wasn't just American, it was Southwest a couple weeks ago. so. So yeah, they're canceling up until we have to stay here. So it's, it kind of leaves us stranded for a while. Incredibly frustrating. Americans awful. Like never flying again. In a letter, COO David Seymour says many cancellations were due to severe winds in Dallas, Fort Worth. He also says staffing is running tight, with crew members out of their regular flight sequences. About two-thirds of Sunday's cancellations were because the airline couldn't get enough flight attendants in the right places, and almost all other cancellations were because of a shortage of pilots. Although vaccine mandates created staffing concerns, the Allied Pilots Association says these cancellations aren't linked to that. Dennis Tager, a spokesperson for the association, says bad management is more to blame. And because the crew isn't properly connected to the airplane, they are suffering just as much as passengers struggling to find hotels. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. In an interview with Nicole Walter at the beginning of the show, she said workers are having all the bargaining chips given the demand for labor. But a new survey suggests most workers haven't got a pay raise in the past year. That is Andrew Thomas is the details. According to a new bank rate survey, 56% of workers haven't received a raise in the past year, and 52% are still earning the same income as before the pandemic. The survey found that 36% of respondents received a raise based on their performance, while 31% got a bump in pay for cost of living. We did see an increase in the prevalence of cost of living increases this year. It's the highest that we've seen in any year uh, dating back to 2016, but it's still the exception rather than the rule. Most pay raises still performance-based promotion or taking on additional responsibilities. McBride says employers are selective about how they dole out raises. Employees need to highlight what they bring to the table, and there are several factors that can help workers who are looking for a raise. Skills, experience, certifications, particular talents you have that separate you from the pack are great bargaining chips, not only with your current employer, but if you decide to put yourself on a free agent market and go look for another job. Inflation has also had an impact on how employers decide to give raises. Many large companies have been able to pass on costs to customers, which is good news for employees looking for a pay bump. But half of Americans work for small businesses, hardest hit by the pandemic. Now, a lot of business owners out there they may want to take care of their people and recognize the sacrifices that they made, but until business fully bounces back, they may not be in a position to do so. But there were some positive signs. 36% of workers say they're making more now than before the pandemic. That's three times higher than people who say they're making less. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And stocks ended modestly higher on Wall Street today, just enough to notch more all-time highs for major indexes. The Dow rose 94 points, about a quarter of a percent. S&P 500 gained 8 points, about two-tenths of a percent. 
And the Nasdaq gained 98 points, about six tenths of a percent today. And amid its rivalry with Pepsi, Coca Cola is buying full control of sports drink company Body Armor. At the moment, Pepsi's Gatorade is by far the leading sports drink in the market. In the Olin Richards reports. Coca-Cola has acquired sports drink maker Body Armor for $5.6 billion, its largest acquisition ever. Coca-Cola previously owned 15% and is now buying the rest from investors such as the NBA's James Harden, MLB's Mike Trout, and even Kobe Bryant, whose estate will collect around $400 million. Gobble up all the well-performing brands in the space simply because Powerade, which has simply been their cornerstone in the industry, is not being able to perform against Gatorade. Jameson Sharp is a principal at Neptune Capital. He says Pepsi's Gatorade currently dominates the $8 billion sports drink market with around 64 percent of the market. Meanwhile, Coke's Powerade only has 13 percent and Body Armor has 18 percent. It's a very smart move on Coca-Cola to snap up the brands that are the most well-performing. You know what? It's good for their sales. It's good for their shareholders. And that's why they do it. Coca-Cola originally purchased 15 percent of Body Armor back in 2018 at $300 million, valuing the company at $2 billion. The latest purchase values the company at around $8 billion. Arlene Richards, NTD News. And Ralph Lauren is looking for ways to draw customers back to stores. It's going to offer color on demand. That means in select stores, you may soon be able to walk in, choose a color, and have your shirt dyed in store right before you buy it. The Daily Straight Quarter is the details. In its flagship stores in New York, Ralph Lauren plans to use new textile coloring technology to enable customers to dye their own polo shirts. Its business partner with the technology told CNBC, so far the details of the in-store dyeing process are unknown, but many people have high expectations. The color thing is, is actually a very good idea. Yeah, I would still buy the polo shirt because I just feel like Ralph Lauren, he's a big brand. Some New Yorkers are showing interest in the new in-store shopping experience Ralph Lauren is trying. I do like online shopping, but this sounds like they're working on something to get people back in the stores. And it sounds really interesting. If they were to dye uh, a, a color that I would want, that would make me come into the store, yes. Pandemic lockdowns hit brick-and-mortar stores hard, driving a boom in e-commerce. So what's the next step for physical stores? Retail analyst at BMO Capital Markets Simon Siegel told CNBC, the store will become more experiential each and every day. The trick is how to capitalize on it to sell more things. He emphasizes that experiential retail heavily relies on customization and rapid production. Ralph Lauren's new strategy is making the customer the creator. Siegel says, this has always been a powerful thing. Bringing the consumer into the story has always been a winning proposition. The new color dye system was first developed to help the company improve its environmental footprint. Ralph Lauren also hopes it will alleviate supply constraints with better balance inventory and more efficiently meet demand for their products, serving consumers exactly what they want. Faye Quarter, NTD News. And Disneyland in Shanghai spiraled into chaos in Halloween night. And no, it wasn't part of the show. Apparently one visitor tested positive for the virus, so they locked the place down with 30,000 people held inside. No test, no exit, no entry for new visitors except hundreds of medical professionals dressed in hazmat suits. Some reports say over 200 buses took visitors home for self-isolation Now the park is closed for the next two days and no info on when it will reopen. Russia is kicking off a week of non-working days for most businesses across the country. It's an attempt to contain the rising CCP virus cases. Ithidis Phil Zoe reports. What's known as non-working days in Russia have started and will last until November 7th. It's like paid leave for most workers. I think it will help. I see that people are not very eager to get vaccinated, and I hope they will go now and get the jab. Non-essential businesses will have to close down while the country tries to stop the spread of the CCP virus. I don't think it will help. I do not believe such measures could help at all. 
non-working week, but people work. That's it. Other residents are more optimistic. I believe it will help. The country's leadership cares for the people's health. Businesses are expected to lose about $60 million per day during this period. Russian President Vladimir Putin said workers' salaries should be paid during this time. But government aid is reportedly limited to subsidized loans matching the country's minimum wage at $180 per month. It would have helped if everybody really stayed home and didn't go to, you know, to Egypt and Turkey, Dubai, Maldives. So I do not know. Let's see then. About one third of Russia's population is considered fully vaccinated at this time. Phil Zhou, NTD News. Still to come this evening. Delta Airlines is teaming up with Peloton to offer classes on some flights. What are they planning and how can it help you when you fly? And communities in California looking for ways to deal with the drought. There's renewed interest in turning salt water into drinkable water. That and more coming up on NTD Business. Ninety percent of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epic Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit. Subscribe today and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. They took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Find her. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back. California is enduring a historic drought. Now communities across the state are looking for new sources of water. One method is gaining renewed interest. It's called desalination plants. Anthony's Andrew Thomas reports. A decade ago, Sand City, California got a desalination plant at a cost of about $12 million. The operators say it's more than paid for itself over the past 10 years by providing drinkable water for the entire town of about 400 people. Desalination, you have the energy cost, you have the front end capital cost, uh, but the benefit that you get is it's drought proof. The ocean is there, it's sustainable, and at times like this, when you need every drop, it is something that keeps supplying that critical water. Desalination sends ocean water through filters that extract fresh water and leave behind salty water that's often returned to the ocean. But some environmentalists say the state should focus on water recycling. It's cheaper than desalination and has less possible impact on marine life. 
Cook says measures are in place to protect marine life and monitor the salinity of discharged water. So for this system, it's vertical intake wells along the beach, about 60 feet deep. So the fact that they're in the sand and not an open water intake, that eliminates that marine life getting into the intake and into the plant that would otherwise be there, that could potentially be there. California already has 12 desalination facilities, including large plants in San Diego and Santa Barbara counties. Regulators appear to be close to approving a new desalination plant in Orange County, which could break ground next year. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And now that Halloween is over, Target is getting a jump start on Christmas. The retailer started its Black Friday sales on Monday. Each week it'll offer holiday best deals, which are the best prices for the whole season. These include electronics, toys, kitchen appliances, apparel, and beauty. New deals are released each Sunday. Not all deals will last the whole week, though. Experts recommend shopping early this year because of shortages and supply chain issues. And you may not have a lot of room on a plane, but Delta Airlines believes it's just enough to get some stretching in mid-flight. Peloton is teaming up with the airline to offer five stretching and meditation classes to flyers. They range from 5 to 20 minutes and are meant to help passengers relax, stretch, or even fall asleep on board. Peloton is expecting the refreshed classes every few months. Right now, they're only available on planes with seatback screens. But Delta was the one that approached the fitness company for the collaboration. But no financial details have been disclosed. As latest business updates for today, you can still catch NTD Evening News with Stephanie Cox. That's at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. For NTD Business, it's all for today. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.